Welcome and thank you for uh, attending um, our conference. And uh, today I'd like to go over some of the basics of some uh, neonatal emergencies as they apply to the primary care physician. Um, I get quite a few calls from a number of people um, who have to deal with some very difficult situations um, and very infrequently. And so it's a good, a good idea to have some of the basics in place to understand how to stabilize kids who are having an acute problem and know how to call for help <clears throat> and what to do in the meantime. So I'm a medical director for the uh, NICU at Children's Hospital uh, at Erlanger. I'm a uh, clinical associate professor at Vanderbilt University Medical Group. And I spend 100% of my time at Erlanger Children's making sure that it's the best place for kids. So I'd like to begin with some of the basics of education as far as what I think most emergency providers or at least someone within your uh, realm of training um, should be ver well versed in in order to deal with emergency situations. First, obviously, is uh, American Academy of Pediatrics Neonatal Resuscitation Program. Uh, NRP is probably the most um, effective tool at uh, dealing with a child at, that's needing uh, resuscitation for the, from birth to about the first 15 minutes of life, which is what it's really geared towards. Um, it's very straightforward. It's airway, breathing, circulation. They do an excellent job of kind of getting a infant from whatever situation there is to at least um, a proper heart rate and breathing. Whether there's a problem or not, there still could be, but we definitely can get the basics started with that. A lot of times I get, get calls at this point, which is we're about 15, 20 minutes into this resuscitation and the child is doing just fine to some extent, but it seems to be having some problems. What do we do then? Um, Chris Carlson was one of the uh, first people to come up with this. It was actually a doctorate project, project of hers uh, some time back. And she wanted to have a program that basically allowed a baby, uh, allowed her to stabilize a baby properly from 15 minutes. And I say the first four hours of life, because most of the people that I see this will be able to be reached within four hours. But um, she lived in Utah uh, and still does. And sometimes in these rural hospitals uh, with the snowstorms that would come in, it could be two days before they actually uh, could get to pick up a, an infant. And so some pediatrician would be out there for two days uh, with a 24 weeker and would have to know what to do. And so it's um, this stable program really addresses uh, some of the basics, which is sugar, temperature, airway, blood pressure, labs, and emotional support. It's an eight hour course and it actually is very helpful in teaching and reviewing some of the basics um, our goal as uh, neonatal providers is to get all of our providers, um, stable educators, and then uh, hopefully send out uh, teams into the community to teach NRP and stable in the near uh, future, hopefully in the next one to two years. Uh, in adjunct to this uh, is cardiac stable, which looks at some of the um, most difficult uh, congenital heart disease that are cyanotic heart lesions that, to deal with, um, truncus, transposition, tricuspid atresia, tetralogies and TAPBR, and of course, acyanotic heart lesions, left-sided lesions. Um, this book has actually been given awards for some of the best diagrams out there and drawings. And um, I highly recommend it just even as a reference to have um, in your office to show people if you think that this is what you think the um, condition might be. It's a very nice reference. All right, so let's start with a, a head to toe approach and we're going to talk about birth trauma. Um, one of the most common things that we'll see in uh, a delivery is a caput. Um, and caput is uh, just for review, what I would call hemorrhagic edema of the skin. Um, that those of you who have probably had an older sibling as a child may uh, remember a game where you had a sibling who uh, would grab your arm and just rub it until the point where it turned red and you, you, could, you could let them do it up until the point you said mercy and they had to stop. 
Well, the kappa is very similar to that. And that's why it crosses the suture line, as you can see, is because it's basically right within the skin. Um, it does have a tamponade effect onto it, obviously, because it's within the skin. And so that's what uh, makes it a birth trauma, but not an emergency situation. The next is the cephalohematoma. This is usually found in some types of vacuum deliveries where the periosteum is lifted off of the bone. Um, interestingly enough, the blood will tamponade um, in between the periosteum and the bone, and obviously will not cross the suture line, as you can see, that it would be um, just be sitting over the bone. And so this is the uh, cephalohematoma. Now you can have issues with these, but generally what we have is issues associated with jaundice. And that is something that can be followed up um, a little bit more slowly and not so urgently. But the one thing that we do worry about is what's called a subgaleal hemorrhage. Um, the aponeurosis is actually attached to your forehead muscle. Um, and so you, if you raise your eyebrows, and, um, you'll notice that this muscle right here has to have something to attach to. So the galea aponeurotica goes from the top of your head all the way to the back of your neck. Um, unfortunately, in some situations like vacuum deliveries, um, if this gets uh, separated from uh, the, uh, the skin, then there is uh, unfortunately no place for the blood to tamponade. And um, an entire baby's blood volume is about 80 per kilo. So if you consider a three kilo baby, the total blood volume is about 240 milliliters. That's not a lot of blood when you think about the size of a baby's head and how much space you can have it, uh, how much you can bleed into. This is an emergency. Uh, this child will, unfortunately, the one or two that I've seen bleed to death within a few hours. If not, I've seen it uh, from the transition from the labor and delivery to the NICU lose about half their blood volume. Um, the signal, the, the traditional sign that you'll see is what they call a fluid wave. So if you tap the uh, volume of the blood on the head, it'll make a, like a little wave across the skin. And it is quite impressive. And uh, as my medical director said when I was in fellowship, once you see one, you'll never forget it. Um, and it is an emergency and it really does need to be transported right away. IV access is incredibly important, as is emergency blood and availability. The next thing that I'd like to talk about is uh, the transition circulation. So we went from a head to toe. Uh, we're going to start now with the airway and breathing. Um, and the first thing that I like to talk about is this little graph here, because I think it puts a lot of things that we're doing into perspective. And the x-axis is time and the y-axis is resistance or the amount of uh, pressure being exerted upon the blood vessels in the, in the body. So the upper line is the pulmonary vascular resistance of so the blood vessels around the lung. And then the lower line here is the systemic vascular resistance. In a normal delivery, our goal is to reverse this process. Um, when a baby is born, oxygen comes into the lungs and it touches the blood vessels around the lungs and then it causes them to dilate. There's a very unique feature of this, these blood vessels. And any disruption of this process where you can't get oxygen to the lung uh, will prevent this from dropping and, and this leads to pulmonary hypertension or persistent fetal circulation. Similarly, over here, this is our baby's systemic blood pressure, or systemic venous, venous vascular resistance. And when you clamp the cord, you remove the huge AV shunt that is the placenta, and the blood pressure shoots up. And any disruption of that can cause this not to happen. So for example, hemorrhage or sepsis or acidosis, all of those things are things that prevent this from going upward. And so we're going to talk about each one of these individually and the things that can cause this not to come down and this not to go up. 
Um, so when we talk about airway, the most common obstruction is the coanal atresia. And as with all good lectures, there has to be one netter pho photograph in there. So here's my netter photograph. Uh, this is the coena shown here. And these, uh, as you know, in infants are obligate nose breathers. And so when these children cry, they're pink, but when they stop crying, they turn blue. And it's basically because the coena have a complete or a partial obstruction um, in the passageway. And this can be diagnosed by looking at um, a, a CT scan. And you'll see right here that this is a, a patent airway right here. And on this side is completely obstructed. And the only way to basically allow this child to breathe is via ET tube or some form of laryngomalacia uh, uh, LMA. And so that brings us to the laryngeal mask airway, which is, I think, something that is really, really underestimated in uh, the world. Uh, when I talk to a lot of general practitioners who have to stabilize a baby, many of them are very concerned about intubating a baby. And unfortunately, I have seen a lot of intubation attempts that have gone awry. Um, it, it, is, it is really an unfortunate situation when uh, someone tries to attempt an airway and really doesn't need to. Um, and so there are a number of ways to prevent uh, this kind of damage by just using certain tools. And the most common is the laryngeal mask airway. Uh, this has actually been used worldwide to give surfactant to, and, and almost anybody can do it. Uh, nurses, respiratory therapists, physicians, you just simply turn this tube up and you place it into the airway and you can, uh, bag mass ventilate very easily. And as you can see, it goes directly over the uh, opening of the trachea and closes off the esophagus. Um, and it is extremely effective and very simple. No, no worry about placement. And you can establish an airway very quick, quickly with this. Um, and we're hoping that this becomes more the standard of care uh, for managing an airway as opposed to empiric intubation. If you do have to intubate or if you don't have an LMA, it's always easy to remember what size you need. And I like to make this pretty simple. So if you're a 40 weeker, it's 4.0. If you're 35 weeks, it's a 3.5 ET tube. If you're 30 weeks, it's a 3.0 and 25, a 2.5. And that pretty much covers the entire gamut of uh, uh, infants who are potentially going to be uh, within your range of intubation. And as you can see, you go from double zero, 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 one, um, pretty much uh, straightforward. So that's a nice thing about neonatology. And this, of course, is covered in NRP. But it's always good to have those on there. Now, what I like to talk about is respiratory distress. So let's say, for example, we have an infant who uh, comes out, is born, is pink, is, is crying, then just starts to start to not be so pink. And you look at the saturations after about 10 minutes of life and you realize, okay, the heart rate's good, but the SATs are in the mid eighties. What could it be? What could be the problem? And I go through this differential pretty straightforward because I like to think of things in terms of uh, keep it simple. Um, so the top things on my list in terms of differential diagnosis, obviously is respiratory distress syndrome. Um, this is the first and foremost, It basically means that the surfactant in the lungs are missing. The rest, um, as you guys know, poop, blood, and pus, anywhere it's not supposed to be, uh, ruins whatever it's touching. And that's kind of universal for the human body. And so with the lungs also, meconium aspiration is ruins surfactant, blood aspiration is ruins surfactant, and pneumonia, which is pus, is ruins surfactant. Um, so it's equivalent, the, the same thing as missing. And that's what we basically want to get across to everyone is that if you have to give something for a cyanotic newborn, we're probably going to give surfactant because it's either missing or ruined. Uh, and as, it, as it all pulmonologists say, if it's not the lungs, it's probably the heart. And that's where the cyanotic heart disease in. <clears throat> so in treating the cyanotic newborn, we have a child who comes out, is 10 minutes old, 15 minutes old now, and SATs are in the mid 80s. 
Well, what do we want to do with that kid? Well, the first thing that we always do, which is the easiest thing to do, is to reverse the hypoxia. We increase the ambient FiO2 around the baby. So usually just take 100% oxygen and blow it onto the baby and see if they respond to it. And if they respond well and quickly, then you know it's probably not as big a problem. But if they don't respond quickly, or it takes a long time for those sats to come up, you know you have a problem there and it might take more. So the two ways to improve oxygenation in a human being is to either give increase the ambient FiO2 or increase the pressure. So with this little device that I've shown over here, this is called a Neopuff. There are a number of examples of this out there now. But it's basically a very simple system where you dial in your PEEP and you dial in your uh, PIP if you need to. But in this case for hypoxia, since you're only dealing with mean air pressure, you can simply put a mask over the baby's mouth and nose, give, good, give a good seal. And five centimeters of pressure is about all you need to improve a baby's oxygenation. And that will take care of most problems. Um, however, if you cannot get the baby to oxygenate over this, um, it's most likely that the, um, the baby is not breathing. And so you look for chest rise and if the baby's not breathing, you wanna start with ventilation, which is helps open up the lung, but also for removing CO2. And the reason I show this slide is because I think that I don't know how many times in medical school, even still today, I run across people who try to make ventilators so confusing and they're not. Um, and Dr. Adams, who was my teacher in fellowship was like, it's just a piece of plastic with a bubble attached. And I was like, okay, that's, uh, that's actually a lot easier to understand. Um, and so I use this little diagram as a teaching tool for everyone, but Essentially, um, with the way you want to think about an ox, uh, ventilator is nothing more than an oxygen source with about eight to 10 liters of flow hooked up to a T-piece connector. And there's a lung attached like a balloon and a valve at the end. Um, if you were to get a blood gas on this baby and look for it, the first thing you're most likely find is hypoxia and some elevated CO2. So you'd have a 709 acidotic, uh, 88, let someone else worry about the rest of this part, <laughs> uh, blood gas. Um, and you would look at this patient and say, okay, they aren't ventilating, they aren't moving their chest, they aren't removing their own carbon dioxide, they need a ventilator or positive pressure ventilation. And so in this diagram, we set up the flow, we put in a 21% um, uh, oxygen source and we put in a blender and we mix the amount we need. We hook it up to the T-piece connector. And the amount of pressure at this point is the PEEP or the five of CPAP that's needed. So as the air moves through here, it extends, it exerts a pressure on here. And PEEP stands for positive end expiratory pressure. So the lung at the end of expiration basically stops and doesn't completely deflate. And so it's the end of expiration and it's positive pressure. This is a very nice, uh, simple explanation for the, how we correct the hypoxia. We give 100% oxygen at five of pressure. Now, if we need to do more than that and remove the CO2, you close the valve and that amount of time that you close the valve is what we call the inspiratory time. And in that case, the lung will expand. How much? Well, it depends. Uh, we can usually do set on a Neo puff, uh, a pressure of about 20, and that's normal. That's about what everybody wants. And then, or if we actually have a ventilator, we can say five per kilo. So a three kilo baby, for example, would be 15 milliliters. And you just pop that right on. And when you let go of that valve, it goes back down to peep. And the amount of time that it takes to do that is known as your expiratory time. And that is one cycle of a ventilator and that's it. It's nothing more complex than that. How you measure everything can get a little bit hairy and dicey, but for the for what you're going to do in an emergency situation with the Neopuff is really exactly what I just showed you. What that looks like graphically is the PEEP is the baseline amount of pressure that you're giving. 
And then when you press the, or hold off, or include the little Neopuff, the amount of time that it increases is the I time. And you go up to a certain pressure in the case of the Neopuff, and it goes up to about 20, 25, and that's the peak inspiratory pressure. And then you let go, and the amount of time that it, ex, ex, in exhalation is your expiratory time. And then your I time plus your E time is essentially one breath cycle. Um, another way that I always try to do this is this is about what a baby does. They take a breath in for about 0.3 seconds and then they exhale for about 1.7 seconds. And if you think about that, that's about 60 seconds per two seconds per breath is about a rate of 30. And that's where we basically get our number. And that's what you wanna be doing with a baby. And what always impresses me is when I actually take a Neopuff and I hook it up to people and they get so scared they end up just holding down on the button and inflating the lungs and forgetting to release it. And then the actual time that it should be open is longer than the amount of time it should be closed. It's kind of weird and kind of feels weird. And sometimes you're like, this isn't working. But remember, just like any balloon, the hardest thing to do is just to get it open. Once it's open, then it's good and it's a lot easier to work. And always reminds me of kids who come to you at a party and say, okay, just blow up this balloon a little bit, but don't blow it up all the way. And it's mostly because they can't blow up that initial, uh, hit, overcome the initial hysteresis, which is the amount of pressure it takes to open the lung. But once it's open, it's a lot easier to work with. And that's what your goal is. So that is the essential aspects of airway and breathing. And so we're looking at once this oxygen has reached inside that the pulmonary vascular resistance will fall. What does that look like in our transition circulation? Well, this was one of the nicest pictures I had um, available to me, which is uh, this is what a baby looks like before they're born. As you can see, there is a small amount of blood that gets to the lungs. Um, so blowing this picture up right here, this right here is our pulmonary vascular resistance and it's very, very high. The reason it's very high or, or squish down is because the only blood that needs to go here is the blood that's needed to grow the lungs. It is not necessarily to oxygen or ventilate, that's all done down here in the placenta. So this amount of blood flow right here is just enough to let the lungs grow. When a baby is born, this fills up with oxygen if there's no problems with the surfactant generally or the shape of the lung. And as this fills up with oxygen, this pressure right here drops, and so the blood is then diverted. Similarly, when we talk about this being a giant AV shunt, those of you uh, who've ever seen uh, in surgery and renal uh, dialysis patients when they take the uh, uh, main blood supply from the, uh, on the left side the um, radial artery and they hook it directly into the venous supply uh, and they blast open the venous supply of the arm, so they can get dialysis catheter in there. That's essentially what this looks like before you clamp it. And when you clamp the cord right here, you shut off this huge AV shunt. That of course transmit this, transmits this pressure back up here. And then this of course then squeezes. And so you end up with more blood here and less blood here. Higher pressures here and lower pressures here. And that again is our natural transition. So to review, we talked about the lungs and we said as long as there's, uh, before the baby's born, it's not filled with oxygen and the vasculature is very tight and looks uh, cyanotic. As the baby then breathes and opens up their lung, oxygen is able to come in, get to the capillary bed, and then blood is then diverted uh, into the lungs for gas exchange and goes in cyanotic and then comes out uh, oxygenated and then heads to the left side of the heart. Similarly over here, we have our descending aorta and we clamp off our cord and the pressure goes up here. So going back to our picture, uh, this is the normal transition process. The pulmonary vascular resistance drops secondary to oxygen any disruption in this process, which is either missing the surfactant or ruining the surfactant, leads to pulmonary hypertension. 
Similarly over here, our systemic vascular resistance is very low. You clamp the cord, cut off the AV shunt of the placenta, and sure enough, shoo, this comes right back up. And this is uh, one of the other graphic representations that I had uh, just to kind of bring the point home. Oxygen uh, is the key for changing the uh, pulmonary vascular resistance and cord clamping is the key to decreasing the systemic vascular resistance. Um, things that can screw up the systemic vascular resistance um, essentially are the stuff that you think that kind of happens in a lot of pregnancies. The most common is sepsis. Anyone who knows, uh, seen an acidotic patient knows that their blood pressure drops. And that's true also with these babies. So if you deprive them of oxygen and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, you know that the acidosis will prevent the blood pressure from coming up and you get a drop in your systemic vascular resistance. And so that's gonna be a problem. Um, other cases where there's an eruption or trauma, um, if the, there's bleeding and the baby's blood volume actually bleeds out, or for example, subgaleal hemorrhage, the systemic vascular resistance isn't gonna come up because there's nothing in it and you're gonna need some blood. So I like to say if a baby is pink and peeing, you have basically transitioned that baby completely. Um, and this is really the easiest way to know whether or not the transition process has occurred. Um, if they don't remain pink or if they stop peeing, you know that this transition hasn't occurred and that's a problem. Another common problem that you see is born out of a sepsis. And so just to review, um, delivery is considered a clean, clean process, not a sterile process. And so any baby that's born um, out of a sepsis uh, or as I like to say on the, on the ambulance trip there or in the taxi cab or car there. Um, this is the basic regimen, CBC blood culture, antibiotics for about 48 hours. And uh, we still use AMP and GENT, 100 per kilo IVQ12 and GENT 4 per kilo IVQ24. Uh, if the blood culture is negative, you can stop. Last thing I wanted to talk about was the neutral thermal environment, because now that you've stabilized this baby and you've gotten the airway done, gotten the oxygenation in, got the ventilation out, it's ex the thing is you're pretty much gonna be waiting for someone to come pick this kid up. And it's incredibly important um, to maintain a baby's temperature. And the reason is, is because um, as you heat up a baby, you increase their, um, de decrease their oxygen availability because of anaerobic metabolism and you get a metabolic acidosis. Um, when they get cold, you get oxygen consumption, increased CO2 production, and you get meta metabolism of brown fat. And that actually, both of those lead to um, diff acidosis within the baby. Here's our decrease in infant temperature. And then of course our increase in infant temperature. Remember babies are a lot like um, our little reptiles out there in the world. If you put them in a hot environment, they'll heat up. If you put them in a cold environment, they'll cool down. They don't exactly have the same temperature regulation mechanisms like we do. So we really wanna make sure we keep them in a neutral thermal environment. And the goal there is of course to prevent heat loss. And the four ways to prevent heat loss are through radiation, conduction, convection, and evaporation. So radiation, which is the loss of heat between skin and the ambient air, um, is pretty simple uh, solution, which is use an overhead heater. So we recommend that all hospitals have some type of overhead heating neonatal system. And the temperature control on that is pretty simple. You just put, hook up the thermometer to the baby. If the baby gets hot, the machine turns off. The baby gets cold, the machine turns on. And it keeps the baby's temperature in a normal range. Conduction, which is a loss of heat through a direct contact with a solid material, um, is another way to prevent heat loss in a baby. Now, this is the big thing that I wanted to talk about, which is using heated chemical mattresses. People try to skirt by because these things are expensive and put uh, blankets in a microwave. Um, microwaves are, do very uneven heating. So if anybody's ever put their dinner in one that's been a little bit cold knows that the outside of your food will actually overheat and the inside will stay, or the middle part of the meal will stay cold. That can happen quite frequently with a blanket. And I have seen babies get second and third degree burns 
from microwave blankets. So do not do that. There are standardized warmers that you can use uh, to keep a, uh, to heat up a blanket. And that is really the only way you're supposed to do that or a chemical mattress. Convection, which is a loss of heat through the skin, the flow velocity of ambient air, which I also like to think of. If you were standing on a beach and there was no breeze and you were wet, it'd be kind of cold. But if the breeze came along, you get even colder, right? Yes. Well, that's what we have incubators for. Um, if you have an incubator in your hospital of some way to prevent the air from blowing over the baby, well, that is probably the best way to prevent the heat loss in that case. Um, I have seen many times just on a radiant warmer, people put a piece of saran wrap over it, which was the old fashioned solution, but um, I recommend actually having at least one or two incubators within your hospital in order to take uh, care of these babies for the time in which uh, someone is not available. And then, of course, evaporation. Um, babies can lose a lot of water through heat, especially as they get more and more premature. Uh, their skin is very thin and down to the under the 32 week range. We basically put these kids in a plastic bag. Um, and there are all sorts of methods out there now for doing this. But in all honesty, this is where just a piece of saran wrap or um, a plastic baggie will do. And between those four uh, simple solutions, which is airway, breathing, circulation, and temperature, you'd be surprised how quickly you can stabilize a child just by providing those um, issues. And we talk about uh, the other things, which are glucose and other stuff. That's all mentioned in the stable program. And I highly recommend that you look into that um, for further expounding on this topic. All right. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it very much. Take care. Well, thank you very much for listening to the lecture. Um, I'm happy to take any questions at this time in the chat. And I don't see any at the moment. So um, some of the other common questions I get about um, uh, wor working with uh, neonates is what, wh what, what level do you want to know where this baby has to go to um, or a NICU or can I just keep it here in the newborn nursery? And that really is interesting because the AAP guidelines have come out and put up uh, a pretty solid line in the sand as to what is considered newborn nursery and what's considered level two, level three, and level four. Uh, some states have gone to actually uh, verifying individual NICUs from uh, whether or not they have these capabilities. And um, it's just real important to uh, make sure that you kind of stay by those guidelines. Tennessee currently right now does not, but it's looking uh, at whether or not they need to be asking hospitals whether they have the correct infrastructure to take care of certain individuals. In this case, um, most newborn nurseries are 35 weeks and above. Um, level two, you really have to be um, 34 and six and below all the way down to 32 weeks. And anything less than 32 weeks um, should be going to a level three or four NICU, which in this case would be um, our hospital uh, Park Ridge is also a level three and um, Vanderbilt. Oh, there's a good question. What level of NICU does Erlanger East have? Currently, uh, Erlanger East has a level two NICU. We have uh, a nurse practitioner and a physician in house 24 seven. Um, and uh, we're able to stabilize just about anything, but anything less than 32 weeks will go straight to um, downtown children's hospital. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, those of you who are interested uh, in learning about anything to do with the children's hospital at Erlanger in terms of quality or um, the new management, please feel free to reach out to me um, at uh, my first name dot my last name at erlanger.org. And I'm happy to set up a time to talk to you and let you see what the changes have been in the last couple of years and um, how things are going, which in my opinion is actually going quite well. All right. Thank you so much.